Welcome to the Second Bite Podcast, where we talk with top entrepreneurs and CEOs about creating valuable companies through creative transactions. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey, welcome back to the Second Bite Podcast. My name is Todd Taskey. I am your host. Um, got a great guest today from Cardinal Technologies. Alex, their CEO, will be with me today. He's going to help me pronounce his last name correctly when he <laughs> joins us. Alex, super happy to have you. Hey, thanks for having me, Todd. Um, before we get started, a couple of things. I want to first thank the people at EOS Worldwide. EOS is an entrepreneurial operating system that is very effective for CEOs from 10 employees to 500 employees, create a system that they can operate their business efficiently and profitably. We've had many guests on the podcast that use them and use them very effectively. Um, if you want to check them out, you can go to EOS Worldwide, and uh, they have all sorts of tools and, and uh, resources for you there. Um, I want to jump into our episode today. One of the great things uh, that I like about this is an opportunity that we have today to talk with Alex. One of the, the, the reasons I think people love this podcast is because we get the opportunity to talk to people that in many cases are, call it unknown or unheard of, that have accomplished something I believe to be very impressive, which is to build a valuable business. In many cases, that it, they have gone on to do a transaction, either a full transaction or a partial, and they're working on their second bite. And then we have a series called Going It Alone for CEOs that have decided to grow their business on their own, to continue to bootstrap it, to not take outside money, investor money, private equity money, or to be acquired by a strategic. And uh, Alex, that is uh, that has been the path you have chosen to date. Maybe you could tell me just a little bit about Cardinal, who you serve as customers and, and what it is that you do for. Yeah, so thanks, Todd. Um, so we are Cardinal Digital Marketing. We're a performance marketing agency for high growth healthcare groups. So performance marketing being SEO, paid search, paid social, and we help healthcare groups that are on consumer healthcare side. So think like you're growing orthopedic, dermatology, um, uh, orthodontic, dental. We help all of those groups scale their location, their providers, and essentially their patients. So we've kind of niched in more as the years have gone along. We've found that these private equity backed high growth healthcare groups are really our niche. So I don't know, that that has helped propel us. It's funny, you get more narrow and you actually grow faster. Yeah, so I'd like to talk about that a little bit. So first of all, you started Cardinal Right out of school, right? Is there a story to that? Or you you just said, hey, I'm going to be a digital marketing guy when I grow up and, and you've been doing that since? No, I, I couldn't stand it. In high school, my dad, we owned a family business and uh, it was actually pinball machines. We had a pinball machine dealership here in Atlanta and he would make me make all the eBay pages and the websites and I had to code it by hand in Dreamweaver. I fucking couldn't stand doing it, but it turns out it was useful uh, down the road. So we graduated Georgia St from Georgia State in 08. My uh, former business partner and I, who co-founded it with me, and we went and worked at one of my dad's companies. It went under six months later from having hired a bad SEO company. We said, let's do this right for SEO co or for small businesses around Atlanta. So we started cold calling the day after my son was born, like six months after graduating. So I left the hospital. Uh, and 12 hours later, I was cold calling uh, businesses. And I actually had my son like on my shoulder would have to hang up. Even if someone was like, yeah, we're interested. I'd have to hang up. Just scream. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy, man. We were on welfare when we started the business. So it was really nice. But you were, that was also 2008, right? That was a shit yeah. storm going on. Yeah. And it created a lot of entrepreneurs, which is what I think happened here over the last year and a half as well. No shit. No one wants to go work at the restaurant. They just went and started their own business and they're marketing themselves on upwork.com now. Uh, so I think that's what happened. You know, I went and interviewed that. Verizon in 08 before taking the job with my dad. I didn't really want to. And so I went and interviewed at Verizon and um, they said, come to the store. I came to the store. I walked in and they said, hey, listen, we want you to sell landline. And I said, what? And they, I want you to sell landlines to people walking in asking for cell phones. I said, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so uh, I started a business. I went and worked with my dad and then we started a business after that. So yeah, when the opportunities aren't present, you see a lot of entrepreneurs spring out of that. So this will be 
a cool time for entrepreneurship these next few years. Yeah, I think so as well. And so you started Cardinal, right? Yeah. And then were you just doing pay-per-click? Were you doing SEO? Were you doing whatever you could do? Were you building websites? Tell me about the early days. We started when I was, I got the business, you know, the new businesses that are incorporated, they publish that list. You have to go to the specific cities. I went and got them. I called everyone. I said, you need a new website? You need a new website? And um, one eventually said, yes, it was a guy that started an ice cream van. Why an ice cream van needs a website beyond me. But anyways, went to his house. Uh, dude had a lot of cats. I, I like cats now. And so we sold the website, 399 bucks, walked into Wells Fargo, thought we were rich. The website looked like shit when we launched and we said, this is not us. We started this company to help small businesses, not hurt them. Pivoted to SEO because we had done a little bit in the past. Stuck with SEO and paid search, uh, well, for the last 12 years. And so, so now we build about- websites too, but it's not really a thing. We- yeah. So let me fast forward a little bit to today because I think there's a lot of interesting things there. First of all, give me a little, give me a, a little bit of context. How big is Cardinal from a from a revenue standpoint uh, and and from an employee standpoint? Yeah, so we have we'll do close to eight million this year in top line. No ad spend included. <laughs> Tell your agency <laughs> people stop including that shit. Ah, a bunch of phonies. They're trying to inflate the numbers. I don't know why. Make some sleep better because that's how you get on. Uh, you know the the Inc. Five thousand easier. No, yes, they use it. They use it. I, I know they do. I know. That. Yes, yeah. when you see agencies that go from like. Uh, this to a thousand percent growth, and they have ten employees, but they do fifteen million. You're like they do so much money. But they also look at because you're about sixty people, right? Forty five FTEs, and then LinkedIn has some of the part timers on there. All right. So if you look at a group that's forty five employees, and they do, you know, fifty five million dollars in revenue, right? Yeah. You understand that something is 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 a little bit amiss from from that yeah. standpoint. Yeah. So, so take me through so. Because uh, on the website, you talk about pay-per-click, SEO, Facebook, all the rest. Can you give me just a rough allocation of revenue based on those verticals? And then and then I'd really like to understand kind of the the what I'm assuming was a gradual progression just to be in the medical space. Yeah. SEO is probably 30% of our business. It was 100 for eight years. And now it's the smaller part of the business. It's crazy. But I love SEO. I still do it for our own site. But um so SEO is about 30% and then paid search and paid socials like 60, web design, conversion rate optimization, all that other stuff is only about 10. And it's really to facilitate the SEO, paid search, paid social. So anything we do on the site, conversion rate optimization, analytics technology, that's to drive performance. It's ancillary. It's like we sell the milk as the loss leader so that you come in and buy the egg or whatever the hell. Right. Do you do there. content as well? And do you charge right. separately or you build it in? You know, we do it for SEO purposes, but we're not a content machine. It's more for the agency. So gotcha. No. Okay. And so, so take me back to to kind of when it started to dawn on you that life would be easier if we just focused on a vertical. Yeah, that was in 2016. I had two big clients, Papa John's and Cox Media Group. They both left me, and they were 25 percent each of our revenue. They both left at the same time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that was not a good 90 day stretch because I had just staffed up thinking they were going to grow based on what they told me. Don't trust your don't trust your friends. Um, and, and so uh, they both dipped out at the same time. That wasn't the biggest problem. The biggest problem was actually not having a pipeline to replace them. I looked around. I said, holy smokes, we have all these people, but they were all tied to two accounts. We don't actually have a company of our own here. We don't have any positioning, we're not known for anything other than maybe local SEO. And that's and, literally uh, just four or five years ago. Yeah, that was five. Yeah, it was five. Wow. And we went down to like two million dollars run rate at that point. And then I said, guys, we have good healthcare experience. I'm passionate about helping patients find the best providers. Let's hedgehog into this. We're really good at it. Now, over the years, our name gets tossed around. The PE groups know us now. And uh, so, yeah, that has helped. Um, that has helped. That has been probably the biggest, the biggest thing, driver of our growth. So, let me, so in inter- intermittent question what's it like when you literally get kicked in the teeth like that and your business falls that dramatically Mm -hmm. i mean that that obviously the story ends better but it's got to be a difficult emotional time right (laughs) uh there have been very few experiences that have been harder and i've had both of my parents die at a young age you know that will you know i'm probably like 62 inside (laughs) 
Yeah, man, that was like the that was the hardest year of my life. Glass door, you get blown up. Everyone goes and talks shit about you, and they say your business, you're going under, you're a schmuck, your leadership team's a schmuck. You don't know what you're doing. You know, when 40 reviews get posted saying that, you almost start to believe it. Um, shit, my own team fired me for a while. I said, Alex, go home and figure this out. Like this isn't working, and so I didn't even come to the office, didn't leave the company for a while, and then um, came back um, and we started to grow the thing again. So yes, that was uh, that was tricky. That was, that was, and, and I think anybody, you know, there, there's a lot of digital marketing guys that listen to this podcast, but there's also a lot of just general entrepreneurs, yeah. right? And so when you get into the valley like that, right, it's hard. It's yeah. definitely hard. And not everybody makes it out of there. And there's certainly much easier routes than trying to dig out of the, uh, the valley and climb back up. So what would you, with the benefit of hindsight, two questions, what did you do? literally like every day to start to claw back and and what do you look back on as the most important lesson learned during that period yeah no client concentration issues going forward i would never take a client let them get above 20 percent. if i did i would just tell the staff hey you're allocated against this you know and we would never do that but you know so client concentration being the big thing and driving your own pipeline not re relying on a gorilla client and so every day more healthcare content we have a healthcare marketing podcast webinar um, and so every day focus on our marketing so that even if I lost two huge clients in one day, I could claw back out with not one single layoff. I also started distributing the PL to the flock every single month. We institute a profit share program and we talk about the PL, 45 people every single month. What can we get rid of? What can we invest more in? So keep, everybody keep out of trouble. Keep us out so of trouble. everybody in Cardinal knows exactly the PL. Every, everything except the salaries. And I think they get drunk and talk about that. So yeah. you didn't start. When did you start doing that and why? 2016, right after I said, guys, we're in the shitter together. You probably don't trust me. I'm going to start including you like I was in a growing business when I was being raised. And I said, and how many guys did you have then? I had eight. You had eight uh, employed. Yeah, we went down to like eight. Crazy. Yeah. Jeez. And now we have 45 and the profit share program is still in place. And I tell everybody, hey, when you're coming in a Cardinal, you're not just going to learn marketing. You're going to get an MBA too and a lot faster. This company belongs to you. You're going to learn how to run it from a business perspective and not just do your SEO job, you know, and it keeps them from wanting to hire people they don't need. Keep software around they no longer use because it affects the whole profit share thing. So we changed a lot. <laughs> Uh, about the company when things hit the shitter. I think if I had been older and didn't have a million dollar debt and they were going to take my house, I would have dipped out. I would not have tried to make it. Yeah, it's <laughs> funny the way the world works, right? Yeah. So do you feel like, so you've grown from eight people to 45. Yeah. And you're still open with everybody, still share all that. Yeah. In In a world where we have literally global competition for good talent. Yeah. Do you feel like that's helped you retain and then also recruit the people you need? It's all of these little intangible things that we do for the flock that adds up to them posting on LinkedIn that they feel valued and they love this place and all this shit. And then their friends end up coming here six months down the road. They're like, I've seen like unsolicited posts and emails and all this kind of shit from your team saying they love it. So all of these things add up to a place where people feel safe, that they belong and that they have ownership. So give me a couple of those things as an example. Yeah, so we institute like uh, the pandemic was at its height. Now it's fucking coming back a little bit. But uh, we had, I believe, in mental health and taking care of uh, that as strongly as like when you break your bone, right? So we have copays on that. I said, I'll cover your copays for the pandemic uh, for anybody. And so made that free. And then they went and posted about that. We just took the whole flock to Asheville, interns included, people that started two days ago. So they post about that. Like all these little things that we do for the team, they are kind enough to go and promote online and they do it uh not with any like they're not trying to recruit by doing it but it helps so yeah all of this stuff is added up we have only had one employee quit three and a half years uh, so it's it, the retention is, is pretty crazy um you know we talked about it before that you've been you know well, we talked about the Inc. 500, Inc. 5000 list, which I know you've been on. You've also been on, you know, top agencies and, uh, you know, best search agencies and the rest. I would assume that you're going to point to your team for having that level of success. 
but there's beyond just the culture, which I think is what you're defining. Is there any other systems that you have inside the business that you think have been most helpful as you've as you've grown the organization? Yeah. You need leadership that believes in the same shit you do. I didn't always have that in place. These people believe in the same thing. They've been with me eight years. They went through the shit with me um, and they believe the same thing. Do we have cardinal qualities, the value system? Yes. Do we talk about it all the time? Yeah. But that's easy to do. Do the leadership team, do they actually live it? Do they enforce it? Do they have fun, but do family harder? Like that's all of these things we believe in. We really live them. I don't think there's one system other than that and bringing on work that's repeatable. You have to convince millennials that expertise is more valuable than variety. Um, and when they become experts and they sound like an expert on the phone, they believe you. And so just bring on the same type of work over and over. So yeah. All of that combined has created a little bit of magic here. It's cool. And the, the this kind of concept of we'll teach you more than SEO or pay-per-click or Facebook or whatever it might be. Does that resonate even with, I mean, the average age of your employees is, is what? Pretty young. By 27, 28. So does yeah. that res, does that resonate with them? They want to feel like they know what the hell is going on and they have a say in it. I went up to Buffalo, New York one time. I walked in like this uh, farmer's market and they said, we're a co-op. I said, who's in charge? We're a co-op. I said, that's what I'm saying. I guess I kind of run a co-op. I believe in servant leadership, not in the religious thing. I'm not religious, but in the fact that I'm the bottom of the totem pole and all these people are here above me. I'm here to serve them. The leadership team are here to serve them. And so I don't know, that's kind of resonated. And, uh, and I believe that they care and we run exercises a couple times a year. I say, if you have a quarter million for a department, where do you spend it? They build presentations. They work in groups like an MBA group. They come back with what to do. And we implement it immediately. They came up with three new hires. We need to make a couple of months ago. We fucking went and hired them. Um, it's the boots on the ground, man. The general doesn't know shit. It's on the horse a hundred miles away from the battle. So they Amen know that. They know so what's going on. So you're you own 100 percent of Cardinal, correct? Yeah, all my fault. And then, and and and, but uh, the reason I ask that question is, I think a lot of people feel like, it, you know, unless people have equity or some kind of equity participation, they're not going to care about the company. You know, when they're not going to care about the company is when you tell them what to do without giving them an impact or input into it. That's when they're not going to care about it. And the CEO has to be on the ground, man. I see a lot of agency CEOs are old as shit. They fucking just want, they're there for the money. Um, and the team can tell I'm here in the pit with them all the time. They just kick me out of the office. They let me back in here to take this interview. But oftentimes they're booking this, like, is the CEO present? Do you give a shit? Like, is this a money grab or are you trying to help build them up? So the intangibles, man. So let's, um, so when you build a good agency and you have, and it's profitable and you've got good clients and you've even got a niche and you've got all those, all the right things happening. Right. So the phone rings from private equity, I'm sure from strategics that want to combine a, is that true? And B you've, you are still independent, have decided not to take that. What, what's some of your thinking around that? Yeah, it's all the time. Now with money so cheap, like it's nonstop, it's nonstop. Hey, we can do this or that. And it's like, why would you? If you're doubling every year, we're going to do a little over two million in EBITDA this year, and we can we're doubling in in revenue, and it's continued to increase. The only holdback is finding enough quality talent, which we're expanding. And if you're growing that fast, these multiples, the private equity firms and stuff are handing out is antiquated. It's not interesting. So you're going to hand out five to seven x on two to three million in EBITDA, and then you're going to give me half up front. Go fuck yourself. Like I don't want a boss. And I can keep this and hand it over to my leadership team for them to run it for the next 10 years. And that, that payout at 2 million, if they don't even grow, it's 20 million. Why am I going to mess with, you know? So I think it's catching agency owners that are tired of the game. And I guess I'm maybe not tired enough yet. And, and perhaps it's because of what you have built. It, it seems like it gives you more energy, not less. Yeah. Yeah. When that shifts and Todd, and you know it, that shifts like a couple of times a year. <laughs> why did i why did i say you're that? on the low end if it's a couple times <laughs> yeah exactly. that's right that's right when that shifts to that's the pervasive thing that probably leads to divorces too when you're unhappy more than happy over a couple of years you just say time to time to move on but the team uh is really good at running it and listen if they decide one day that an exit's really interesting and they want to do it 
I will facilitate that for them. And if they can get paid really well on it and they're all excited to become part of something, I won't even say bigger or better because it won't be. But if they want to do something different, they want a big paycheck, hell, I'll facilitate that for them. But it's not a unilateral decision. We don't run like that. And do you feel like there's something that could accelerate your growth that outside capital could help with? Yeah, I think agency is the big struggle right now is finding quality talent. So if someone could come in and say, I'm going to, you, here's a million bucks, go hire two more recruiters, recruit nationwide, and you can pay them 10% above market so you can secure them. That's probably really interesting to an agency right now. So they can pay above market. You see some of the bigger, like, uh, I won't name names, some of the PE backed agency, you can see them going and doing that. And yeah. that makes sense. Uh, if you were to give a million bucks to accelerate pipeline, I could add a video, a graphic design, all that. But that owner needs to not want to own their company anymore. They're going to have a boss. They're going to have a board, all of that stuff. Like that's, you know, to, to me at least, very uninteresting to have to answer to anyone or take money. I've had debt before, and I see that as being really useful for some to accelerate growth because it definitely would. But you have to want that model. You have to want that model. And, and so when you think about the future of the business, is that the main constraint to you now? Is it just getting the resources, the people that you need? The people that you need. Um, yeah, that's the main constraint because our marketing uh, machine works really well. Um, we're turning away. We're saying, hey, listen, what is it? 8-5 right now. Sorry to date whenever this post, but it's 8-5 right now. We're telling people earliest start is October because we're going to maintain to- top quality. You're going to get a really good team. That fucking sucks. You know how many clients are saying, like, I got to move on? Huh. Yeah, so that's the main. So these clients, are, these clients that are coming that that yeah. you just referenced there, are they coming to you because they want expertise in the medical space? Yeah, they almost like some of the PE back groups are coming into healthcare for the first time, and so they get to us for healthcare for the performance marketing stuff. So some that really really want the expertise are willing to wait. Some that just want immediate growth and see you as entertainment. Maybe that's okay. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. And so you're in Atlanta, your mm-hmm. 45 people, are they all in Atlanta? And how are you managing coming mm-hmm. into the office or not coming into the office, all that part? Yeah, 90% are. And then we have some remote uh, people. We're hiring more remote, though, so that we can keep up with the growth. I, I made that decision about 30 days ago. I said, guys, like, Atlanta's awesome. They can be part of more of the fun parties we throw. And I get magicians and still water and all this stuff every couple of months and take the like it's more fun to be here, um, but we can't keep up. So we've started hiring more and more remote, uh, and it's tough. I mean, it's tricky. It's a tough balance. I have a name. I said uh, this week, it's up to them if they want to come in. We have a cool, really cool spot here in, in Atlanta. But I said, like the whole time, I've said you, you guys do what you want. At most, I've asked them to come in one day a week, and then uh, I put a pause on that. And just volunteer. Yeah, and so the. How are you going to manage the challenge of having new people? How are you managing the challenge of having new people remote? It's one thing when the people got the culture because we were in the office and now we're doing it from home. But people that have never had that opportunity, how how do you manage that? What are the challenges there? You want to try to find people that were already doing remote, which is getting easier now. (laughs) So they're used to it. Todd, I would hesitate to hire someone 23 out of school remote. We actually would probably never do that. So they need to be fairly well seasoned, independent. They've done it before. Uh, they know how the game works. Um, I will say this: like, it is tough to do hybrid because, like, it's even hard to set up the internal meetings when I have people in person and somewhere else. That's weird when they're meeting here in person, but one's remote. That's weird. So. It's tricky, but like in a creative agency to do everything remote, I've learned just from the few months we've been open here, the, I don't know if it's productivity is the right word, but the innovation, the creativity, the trust in each other is much improved face to face. So full remote is, I know it's not in the game. I think, you know, Todd, the big SaaS companies are first to say, we're fully remote. No fucking shit. You got a hundred million dollars in backing. You have to hire as fast as possible. You're not remote because you think it's going to help your creative productivity or anything like that, you're, you're remote because you got a ton of money and you need to hire fast too. And then they set the table where everybody has to follow. It's like, oh yeah. my God. So let's talk about secret sauce for a second. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to ask you to, to share any of that specifically, but there's 
a, a strength that you have because you've kind of gone into a specific vertical. Yeah. What is it about being in that vertical that has perhaps changed your marketing, changed your delivery, changed the way you manage internally? Is there any of it that is that has made that easier and more effective for you? Uh, our in, in professional services, the only secret sauce you have is the experience. And that team with the experience has to be present. You know, they have to still be at the company. So case studies are like kind of irrelevant. The team's not there. Um, so that's how we tell those. We tell those stories well, and then we make sure that the teams can execute on them. So that's all helped scale. What's not helping is that we're bringing people on and we're saying, hey, you got to be up speed in like two weeks. You know, the runtime is just too quick right now. Uh, much like restaurants, I guess everybody went to digital marketing all at once last year and all agencies are now in vote. Now we're the cool guy. All right, cool. We've been telling y'all for 10 years yeah. we're the way to go. <laughs> so now we're the cool ones and, and we're having everyone's having trouble keeping up. So I guess fun time, but but strange. Yeah. Gotcha. Do you do you hire people that are experienced and does that help bring them up to speed more quickly? Or do you yeah. like to have people that you can train on your own? There are not enough trained people out there to grow as fast as we are growing. Um, so yes, we look for trained people and that's three quarters of the people, but we also have interim programs. Uh, that we grab from all the colleges here every six months. So yeah, combination, three quarters of them are experienced because we're doing larger projects. Our average retainer is like 200K a year. Um, so we're not running a high volume shop. They need to know what the hell they're doing. Yeah, that's great. How many clients do you have currently? 45, 50. Yeah. yeah, narrow and deep seems to be very effective. So, so let me ask this last couple last questions and I'll bring us in on time. You know, there's a lot of advice out there on how to grow a good business, how to grow a, a great agency. Mm. What would you share as a couple of things that maybe ha have been kind of guiding uh, pieces of advice or things that you have learned along the way that if you were to really point to, you would say, this is the reason why Cardinal is where it is today? Hmm. I think I've always done the right thing, even when no one was watching. And so they will too. So they will always do that for their clients as well. Um, they being your people, your employee. Yeah, yeah the team, the flock. Um, they see how hard I work. And so they do too. Nothing is top down. I live the experience. And so they also do. So you have to recruit the right people that are willing to do that. And then there are the more specific things like client concentration and marketing and pipeline. Like you have to get a really great position. You have to do the marketing really well. And then you also have to find a team that will execute it really well. Entrepreneurs are usually one or the other. They're either the creative side that can go market. Sorry, they're either the marketing and sales side, which is three out of four, I think, or they're the creative side. You need to go find the opposite ones because you're going to go sell a bunch of projects you can't execute, or you're never going to sell anything that you could execute really well. So, um, yeah. So, Finding the right balance in the team, good marketing, uh, and then living in the trenches with the team has, has proven well for us. So you have so obviously the key is that you've got a you've got a great team, right? As you've spoken about for this entire episode. Is there something you've learned in the interview process or the hire process, either a question or a trait or something yeah. of that nature that has, has been critical in terms of your hiring success? Yeah, I asked one question and Everyone that uh, has joined Cardinal answers it the same way. If they don't, we don't hire them. But one question is, what makes you jump out of bed in the morning? Um, and it has to be, the answer always has to be, I'm afraid to say it here because they're going to fucking watch this and say it when we ask them, but it has to be learn something new, to learn something new. Those are the curious people who never stop learning, never stop trying for their clients, who constantly innovate, and that's what it takes to win here. That's and great. Anyone who gave a different answer to that, was lazy or didn't work out. Always didn't work out though. And the people that interesting. Have, every single person says the same thing here. Uh, so it's a that's problem. interesting, and very generous of you to share that. So thank you. I'll I'll end with this. So you've you've obviously been very successful. You have a successful business today, but I, I think the story of how you got there is is um, is very interesting and telling. What did you learn that's that's created a, a lasting impression on you that you learned? from an experience 
from a person, from a book that you would share as mm -hmm. something that has just been an, an important resource for you that you're thankful that you came across? Yeah. I would say um, in 2016, I kept reading that. I think it's Teddy Roosevelt, the the quote about don't pay attention to anyone not in the trenches. And I was like, these people were in the trenches. Should I pay attention? But they're not anymore. <laughs> And so um, I think it's really important to only listen to the people that are that are around you, what they think, what they care about. Those are the people that know most. And then I would say failure is not final. I don't remember who the quote is from, uh, but that helped. You're going to run into these bumps along the way and failure and shit, failures. But you really only fail if you quit. You only fail if you quit. And, and so did you, it's, you're applying a lot of principles in your business that you don't have a, I don't think you have a name for. Did you just learn that because you're observant and it makes sense to you? Or did you did you learn the concept of being a servant leader? There's books on that. Did you learn that and say, geez, this makes sense to me. This is how we should do it. Or is that just mm -hmm. a reflection of who you are? Mm, I read books nonstop. I'm reading Giftology right now. I thought I just got you're reading what? Giftology. Giftology. Uh, yeah, how to give like custom gifts and shit to clients as a biz dev type thing. What? Well, yeah, one little stupid thing. But yeah, constantly reading books, but sometimes I read them after the fact. Great Game of Business by Jack something. That was the financial transparency thing that we do. I said, this motherfucker. All right, all right, all right, hold on. So you got to go a little bit slower so I can yeah. pick some of this up. The Great yeah. Game of Business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By Jack something. I can't remember his last name. Y'all can Google it. The title it. of the book will work. That's cool. Yeah. The Great Game of Business. Okay. Yeah, great Game of Business. It's all about financial transparency. It's all about essentially what we do here, educating, doing the full PNL. That's a great way to start um, running the business that way. And then you have to back it up with a profit share program. But um, yeah, reading the books, no, it really helped. Um, good to great during the tough times was really important. I passed it out to the leadership team. I said, guys, there's nothing wrong with what we have to do here with the team. Like we hate doing it, but sometimes we are the wrong bus. They're in the wrong seat. So yeah, all of these books that everyone touts are important. But Todd, like when I was a 25 year old, there's just no substitute for doing it. And then when shit hit the fan in 2016, you know what I did? Stop reading books. I just went and worked. I just went. And yeah. yeah. You have to, you know, and I was in Vistage for I don't know how many years. It was really cool. And I heard about the EOS thing and we started going through it. And it's all cool. But at the end of the day, you need to stop talking. You need to stop listening. You need to go the F to work. You know, and um, so you got to balance that. I was reading too much and listening too much and not working enough at some point. So well, that, my mean. man, is a great way to end this podcast. I'll leave it out there. Um, what makes the podcast great is is the generosity of people that we have on as guests to tell their story and to tell it openly um, and to recognize that there's flaws in every business, there's struggles in every business. Nothing is perfect on the inside. And even if it looks like it is on the outside. And Alex, to have you on to to share that, I uh, I appreciate it. And we will be interested to watch Cardinal continue to grow and have success. And I thank you so much for for being on our podcast. Thanks, Todd. And no, the shirts aren't for sale. In case anyone's <laughs> wondering, the <laughs> Run PPC shirt I think is legit. I really like. <laughs> yeah, that. this is good. We got a good one. We got the marketer by the Godfather. We got that one. That was one of my favorites. Yes, but thanks for having me on. It's fun to talk about the business and help anyone I can. Great having you, Alex. Thanks a bunch. Thanks for listening to the Second Bite Podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.